This is Rob Coston at Nautilus International. Um, I'm once again talking to our Director of Organising, Martin Gray, about the situation at the Royal Fleet Auxiliary, where our members have been taking industrial action for months now um, after putting up with years of pay austerity. Um, they want things to change at the RFA um, and they're fighting for it strongly. Uh, Martin, thanks very much for joining me again. Thanks, Rob. Nice to be here. Thank you. So since we last spoke, um, Nautilus uh, had by law to hold a second ballot so that we could continue to have a mandate for industrial action. Um, and I think it's fair to say our members sent a really strong message with that ballot. So, yeah, perhaps you could start by telling me what happened and, and what the result was. Absolutely. So the uh, the reballot for um, continuation of industrial action ended on the 4th of November. Uh, we had a 63% turnout, which for a workforce that spends more than half of the year um, away from home at sea and with the legislation that we have to follow being so prohibitive and restrictive, um, is an incredible result. It's absolutely astounding to get a 63% mm -hmm. turnout. Um, the members very strongly in favour of industrial action short of a strike with 97% of those participating voting in favour of that. And we had 90% in favour of strike action. So we have a renewed mandate for industrial action against the Ministry of Defence and Royal Fleet Auxiliary by the membership who is determined to receive fair pay for the work they do. For yeah. far too long, they're and underpaid. I, I just say, Martin, I'd, I'd point out that's significantly higher than it was in the first ballot. Um, so they're even more convinced, I think, that it's necessary. It, it, it absolutely is. I think a lot of the reason behind that is um, the first ballot was the first ever ballot that we'd taken Royal Fleet Auxiliary members through. And there's a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot of concern over the practicalities of how it would work. And indeed, as we move towards that, that historic first day on the 15th of August 2024, where we held uh, strike action at Royal Fleet Auxiliary for the first time ever, there was an awful lot of concern and uncertainty. I think what the members have seen is that strike action isn't as challenging, as complicated as convoluted as what they may have thought it would be, but they have seen that it does have significant impacts on their employer. And they have seen that what it does is get more people engaged around the dispute and get people talking about the pay and conditions with which they're uh, operating under. Yeah, I mean, and just to give some figures here, uh, it was 79% voted for strike action uh, the first time around. And I think you said it's 90% this time. Um, and it was 85% uh, voted for action short of a strike in the first ballot uh, and that's uh, now up to 97 percent. so it's a really big and significant jump and I, I think that reflects the strength of feeling among the members after months of, of fighting for this yeah we also had an extra three percent uh turnout so it was 60 percent was the original turnout for that first ballot it was 63 percent this time but equally if we just look at the raw numbers we have had an increase in rfa membership so the number of northless members that are employed by the royal fleet auxiliary increased uh by more than 50 in the period be between that first ballot and the second ballot that we've held so not only do we have more members there but we have a greater proportion of that higher density of membership willing to take action which i think sends a very very clear signal to the employer to the ministry of defense to the royal fleet auxiliary leadership that more needs to be done to resolve this and resolve this in a way in which it's going to be to the member satisfaction great and um obviously throughout the balloting process and, and sub subsequently um those negotiations have carried on um is i know it's very sensitive but is there anything you can reveal at this point about how that's been going and, and what the future might hold there We've we received a uh, written offer that was put to us on the 24th of October, which we've discussed with the members of the Royal Fleet Auxiliary and we've discussed with Ministry of Defence. Um, we've made it clear that we don't think the offer that they're able to uh, bring forward by itself is good enough. And we don't think the warm words that the members have been hearing from the Ministry of Defence and from RFA leadership for the last decade are good enough anymore. So we're looking for tangibles. We're looking for things that actually can demonstrate commitment and things that have uh, consequences for failure to meet deadlines, for failure to meet, you know, sort of agreed steps. So that's what we're looking for with that. Uh, we were in talks with the Ministry of Defence on uh, Tuesday, which was the 12th of November, uh, the talks that we had seemed fairly 
clear they were very frank and open and being able to engage in talks like that is very helpful at this stage of a dispute where we can very much just hone in on what the key resolutions need to be looking like in order for for, for the dispute to be resolved and in order for us to be able to present something to the members that they might actually find acceptable uh, we have been consistently listening to the views of all of the members that we have at RFA. We have surveyed them across the disputes, across what actions being taken. Uh, when we've been out on picket lines and at demonstrations with them, we've listened to what they've got to say so that we are fully aware of what we believe is going to take to solve this, to allow us to move forward and to deliver more meaningful change and reform for the future that's going to put the RFA in a position where it is a growing service because what is quite clear is the need for Royal Fleet Auxiliaries, they've been demonstrated time and time again. The need for the people that deliver the, op are the operations of the Royal Fleet Auxiliary is essential. And with the retention challenges that the poor pay, poor working conditions is having, um, that is looking at being something that's a very, very much a concern for the future. So a lot of effort to resolve this now, we'll deal with the initial retention challenges with some medium and longer term efforts to get the RFA into a position where it needs to be for the future, where it is more than capable of supporting the Royal Navy and the Royal Marines and fulfilling its tasking. Yeah, well, um, those negotiations I know will carry on and, and very best of luck with those. Uh, now we have the renewed mandate for action short of a strike and strike action. Um, is there any word on that as yet? Um, or, yeah, is that something that's still being planned? So what we're doing is we are, whilst engaged in conversations, talks, discussions with the employer, we are still building up uh, plans and strategies as to when will be the most effective times to take further action when will be the most effective time to recommend industrial action short of a strike and when will be the most effective times to uh, and patterns to pick for any strike action so whilst in the immediate future there are no uh, there are no plans as yet to move towards um, a resumption of industrial action uh, it is likely that if progress isn't being made in the discussions that we will need to, um, to to revisit that point and to make sure that we use the mandate that the members have given us to try and deliver further leverage to put us in a position where the discussions can be resolved with a bit more speed and pace. Great. Thank you, Martin. Well, uh, thanks again for the update and best of luck in the negotiations. And I'm sure we'll talk soon about it. Thank you, Rob.